Uh, and Max is busy telling everyone about Triangle Passage. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks everybody for coming as well as everybody online. Um, today's talk is about the hydrology of Mammoth Cave at Janolan. Uh, Janolan is obviously one of our most visited cast areas and Mammoth Cave is the largest of the wild caves at Janolan. I think it's fair to say that Mammoth is not fully explored. Um, we still find new things and in particular the hydrology is not fully understood. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that the underground river, uh, which we affectionately term Lower River in Janolan, uh, sorry, in Mammoth, um, we know that that travels underground between Mammoth and Spider and then ends up being the river that supplies the drinking water to the show caves, but we don't actually know where the passage is that contains this river. So uh, I thought today I would start off with a little bit of a summary of what's been happening at Janolan over the past uh, five years or so. Um, there's been drought, there's been fire, there's been flood, and of course, COVID. Uh, so the timeline here is that in 2017, uh, the last sort of heavy rain that was had was in mid-March, and then the drought begins shortly thereafter. And that drought persists for about two and a half years. And then bushfires burnt through much of the cast as well as much of Australia. And the caver's cottage was raised by those fires. Um, and then the drought ended pretty spectacularly in February of 2020, when 210 millimetres of rain fell in two days. Uh, this caused widespread flooding at Janolan and firmly ended the drought. The Five Mile Hill was closed a month later due to rock falls that um, were so essentially precipitated by that heavy rainfall. And then the following day, um, COVID woes were added to those fires and floods. And I've written there that the SUS permit was denied because this is a SUS presentation after all, but um, all, all recreational caving was suspended at that time, as well as the tourism uh, operation that they have at Janolan. Um, a year later, there were further uh, slope failures. There were major slope failures on both of the access roads, the five mile and two mile hill, uh, which led to Janolan being closed for another lengthy period. And so it wasn't until mid-2021 that SUS had its first caving trip at Janolan since uh, December 2019. So that's the first trip in 18 months. And it was not until November of last year that we got regular access to Janolan. Again. And so now we're able to uh, hold monthly trips, although the trip this coming weekend is having to be postponed because of yet more heavy rainfall. And that brings us to the present day. Um, so let's start with the drought. So Janolan experienced its second driest period since records began. Uh, they began in 1895. And so the drought was the driest period Janolan had had in 115 years. Um, I wrote an article for Helictite on this um, that you can go and look up if you'd like the details. Uh, I'll show uh, some of the conclusions of that article in this talk. Um, the photos that I've got here are, uh, the one on the left there is Jen Evans at Ice Pick Lake. You can see the dive line above her head there. Um, that's the lowest that Ice Pick, the well, lowest that I've seen Ice Pick Lake. It's presumably the lowest Ice Pick Lake has ever been, um, simply because that's as dry as Janolan has ever been. Uh, do you want me to sort those lights out, Max? Just just... Yeah, I can do it from here. Uh, room lights, low. Is that helping? I can just put them off. Yeah. Yeah? There yeah, we go. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that's Jen and there's the dive line tile. It's above her head. I mean, yes, she's crouching, uh, but it gives you an impression of how low the water level got. Um, for comparison, now that entire chamber is flooded and the next chamber above it is also flooded. Uh, so the water level now is probably five-ish meters higher than it was in that photo. And on the right there is Josh Parker. He's in the overflow sump. Um, that was in May of 2018. That's the second, uh, sorry, the third time that uh, any group had ever been through the overflow sump. So that only dries up roughly once a decade, maybe a bit rarer than that. So after the drought came the fires, the black summer bushfires. Um, these burnt through 1,000 hectares of karst all the way from Urangabili in, um, in the snowies all the way up to uh, Kempsey on the mid-north coast. Um, 3,500 homes were lost nationwide due to these fires, including the Cavus Cottage, which was a second home to most of us. 
Uh, I think in the years of 2018 and 2019, I clocked up an average of 50 nights a year at the Cavers Cottage. So uh, definitely second home territory. And I know people in this club have been visiting there for a very long time indeed. And we still haven't really got a good solution to this accommodation problem. Uh, and then came the floods. Um, in 2020, in February, there was 5.4 times the monthly median rain, um, 210 mil of which came down in two days, as I said, and this led to widespread damage. Um, the photo on the left there is um, of the old guide's hut, and you can see all the gravel on the road there. And on the right is the Blue Lake, uh, also full of gravel. Um, after that, they closed the five mile hill on weekdays to try and transport gravel that they excavated from the Blue Lake. And um, here's, here's that same lake uh, from another angle. And all you really see there is streams flowing over the top of the gravel, which is of course saturated. Um, there's a little bit of water in the back there and then you get up to where the dam is. So um, the dam is sort of along that line at the back there at the top. And following that, um, there were the rock falls. Um, the 181 mil in one day of March, which was the following month, um, led to 26 major rock falls. Uh, 970 tons of unstable slope material had to be removed from the five mile hill and uh, two and a half kilometers of guardrail had to be replaced. And um, that didn't really fix the problem for long because the very next year there was a major slope failure on the five mile where half of the road disappeared down the cliff. Uh, there was a separate major slope failure on the two mile hill, which has led to the two mile hill being uh, relegated to a one way road, or at least a one vehicle road. They now run a shuttle bus service. Um, and then there were subsequent COVID related closures as well. So it's safe to say that hasn't, it hasn't been a very good time at Genola as of late. And um, this has important implications for access and for our accommodation as well, of course, because we lost the Cavers Cottage. So if you're driving now from Sydney, uh, you basically have to go uh, almost via Oberon. There's a, there's a little road you can take that saves going all the way into Oberon. And you can get to the, uh, the car park number two on the two mile hill, and then you park there and you can either get the shuttle bus down to the tourist area, or you can you know, walk into the valley from there. Uh, we did have a temporary accommodation arrangement to stay in the Janolan cottages, which are located at this black star here. Um, unfortunately, they've succumbed to the rain as well. They've got a, um, a bit of damage on there, so they're out for the foreseeable future too. Um, it was a bit inconvenient having to drive from those cottages all the way around to, to this side um, in order to go caving, but um, you, know, you do what you have to do when you want to go caving. Um, and so now, uh, accommodation options are basically, you know, pay a uh, top dollar for the tourist option or camp somewhere, uh, pretty much. So why does all this matter? Uh, well, it matters because uh, droughts and floods give us the opportunity to make inferences about the hydrology in extreme conditions. So in droughts, you get various cave passages that are going to dry up, um, like the overflow sump that you saw before. And in floods, uh, you will see water in places you don't normally see water, which might suggest a connection between two different areas of cave. But if we can't get there, we can't make those observations. Uh, but there are other observations that we can make. Um, we can use rainfall data. So we can use data from the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, this little um, image on the top here uh, basically shows the dates on which we have data and the dates we don't. So the general weather station opened up in 1895. And it took data pretty much continuously until the mid 70s. And then there was a 10 year hiatus where there was no data. And then data has been fairly reliable since, but um, it's been pretty patchy in the last year or two because the staff haven't been able to get on site because of COVID, fire, floods, et cetera. And this map here shows the locations of the Janolan weather station and three nearby stations. So what I do is I supplement the Janolan data with data from these other three stations in order to form a complete rainfall record without any gaps. Uh, the methodology here is basically just to take the arithmetic mean of these other three stations when all three have data. And if, if Janolan and one of the other three don't have data, then I just take rainfall data in order of proximity, um, starting at, um, at Lothar, which is actually it's almost equidistant from the Oberon station, but the climate's actually slightly more similar at Lothar to Janolan. So I took order of preference Lothar, then Oberon, then Little Hartley stations. Before doing that combination, I also normalized the rainfall data 
uh, to the mean of each site. Um, and the, the preference of Lothar over Oberon just allows you to minimize the normalization correction coefficients if you care what that means. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what it gives you is nice little graphs like this. Um, so this is a 100 day cumulative rainfall plot. Um, it basically gives you an indication of how wet or dry the ground is. Um, so this is cumulative rainfall over the past 100 days at some given date. And so this is evaluated as every day. So on the x-axis at the bottom, this is every day represented as an integer. And then on the top axis, I've just got calendar year because obviously that's a bit easier to relate to. The data in blue are data from Janolan Station itself, and the data in red are ones that have been interpolated from the nearby stations. And the good thing is you can see there's a pretty strong correlation between what's happening at Janolan in the background and what's happening in the red data points that lie at the top. So we can be pretty confident that the interpolation method's doing a good job there. Um, so I can superimpose on this some uh, features you might have already spotted. Um, so the Federation drought was Australia's uh, worst drought in um, recorded history, at least that we know of, um, and that was around 1902-1903. There was also a pretty um, lengthy drought, but not quite as severe during World War II. And uh, if we fast forward to the present day, uh, Janolan went from being uh, in its driest period, sorry, second driest period on record, to its second wettest period on record in a very short space of time indeed. Um, and that's why we're seeing the conditions that we're seeing right now. Another way that you can plot these data is um, just uh, for a given day in a given year, you can plot the cumulative rainfall that's been received. Um, so what this graph is showing at the moment, the black line is the median rainfall um, cumulative across the year, um, uh, across this particular time span. So it's the median of these years. The dark band shows you the one sigma range, so 65% sorry, 68% of the data should fall within one sigma of the median. And then there's also the two sigma line there and 95% of the data should fall within two sigma of the median. And that means if you have a year that is wetter than this light gray line, that's gonna happen about twice per century. And if you have something that's drier than this gray line, that's also only gonna happen about twice per century. Now, if we add on uh, the last five years, this is what it looks like. Uh, we'll start with 2017. Uh, this was the intense rainfall period in March 2017, after which the curve pretty much flatlines. And the year ends a bit drier than average, but not too much. Uh, then 2018 is a, a very dry year, and 2019 is beyond that two sigma line. So that kind of drought you would expect to happen uh, less than twice per century. And that was shown in that rainfall chart I showed before. That was immediately followed by the year 2020, which was beyond two sigma in how wet that year was, and then 2021, which went the same way. Um, just for your information, 2022 is shaping up at the moment to be a two sigma year as well and how wet that is. So that's part one of today's talk. And what we're all really here to hear about is Mammoth Cave. Um, this is a three-dimensional rendering of Mammoth Cave that's uh, come out of the SUS survey data. Um, Phil Maynard, it's fair to say, took charge and led that survey, but with the contribution of hundreds of cavers, um, not only from SUS, but also visitors as well. Uh, what you might recognize here in the, in the south, um, sorry, this, this in the bottom right shows you which way you're facing. So it's currently facing north. Um, this down here is, is Slug Lake at the southern end of the cave. Uh, you've got World of Mud, which is the high point on the east side. And um, this is part of Great North Cavern at the far northern end there. Uh, I didn't mean to play that again, thank you. Okay, um, so as a bit of an overview, uh, Mammoth has about uh, 9.5 kilometers of surveyed passage. Um, I like to say it has two and a half rivers because it has lower river and central river. And then there's waterfall passage, which is this sort of perennial stream but never really has much flow in it. Um, and then it has three, what I would call proper lakes and several sumps or sort of pseudo lakes. Um, and I'm calling Grinning Monster and Damocles Lake pseudo lakes. Um, Chris, you, did you, were you the one who named Damocles Lake? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Do you take objection to me not calling it a proper lake? No. no okay, fair enough. <laughs> All righty. Um, so let's uh, talk first about Lower River. Um, um, it's it's sort of 
I, I was going to say it's sort of temporary in the sense that we've, we've Simon, been, could you repeat that question? Yeah. I just that we just didn't hear that online. Oh yeah, sorry. Kia's question is, what do you mean by pseudo lake? Like, what makes Damocles a pseudo lake? Um, and uh, I suppose the answer to that is, I, I was thinking that because it's we've seen it dried out and we've explored the bottom of it, it seems sort of temporary. But uh, in retrospect, uh, that was during a you know once per century level of drought, so maybe that's being a bit harsh. Uh, <laughs> so, right, lower. I, I, I think it's probably more like a, uh, it depends what you call a lake, but it's more like a perched sun, as I understand it. Um, yes. Because there's a bit of an S bend past that point that ultimately runs down into a um, central river when the water is flowing. Yeah, so Chris Norton's comment for those who are online is that it, it, I guess it's more of a sort of perched sump than a, than a lake proper, but um, we'll, we'll talk about Damocles in a little while. Um, so here's Lower River. This is just um, sort of an extract from uh, the Sus Bull where Phil published maps of Southern Mammoth. Um, Lower River is only seen for about 20 meters of the cave, so not very much of it is seen at all, uh, especially for a cave that's 9.5 kilometers long. It flows out of two holes in the wall. You can actually see those two holes on this map. Um, there, um, you can't see my cursor at all now, can you? Um, sorry, there we go. Uh, two holes in the wall there. And it flows out under pressure. The upstream end has been dived. It was dived by Rod O'Brien to a depth of about 50 meters, after which I understand it got very horrible and tight and full of gravel and he sensibly aborted at that point and came back. Um, at very low flow, like in the 2018 drought, it only flows out of one of the holes in the wall and it's very shallow. Um, so here's a photo of Lower River in the drought. I apologize for the contrast, but you can see there are two holes in the wall here and there's not actually anything flowing out of this one. You probably can't see that too well on the projection, but um, please believe me that it wasn't flowing out of this hole, only flowing out of that one. Okay, um, so what happens when it floods? Um, that's obviously very challenging to observe because some Southern Mammoth is not a place you want to be when the cave is in flood. It's a very low point, it's a very wet point. It's just not a good idea to be there. Um, so this is what we observed in February, 2022 when the cave was not in flood, but the water level was nonetheless very high. Um, so I'm drawing on basically the shorelines and the shoreline on the far side doesn't move much because that's a pretty steep bank. And uh, on the north side, um, you're basically in the river before you can really see that you're in the river, if you know what I mean. You get in the water before you're even in the passage that normally contains the river. And also of interest is that there's a large new debris bank that's built up over here uh, on this fairly steep slope. And I'll talk a bit more about that debris bank later on. Uh, as far as we know, lower river drains into Slug Lake. Um, however, it doesn't simply flow into the lake at its surface. Uh, there's an inlet about six meters below the normal surface of the lake, which is the surface drawn in this map, um, but that's not where the water level currently is. Um, in January of 2022, that's where the water level was. It was about at the dive line tie off. And I suspect now that um, that passage is flooded to a much, much deeper extent. Um, so here's, uh, here's an extract from the three-dimensional uh, survey of uh, Slug Lake. Uh, this elevated area just here is the same one that you can see on the uh, plan view over here. And so what happens after that is the lake sort of slowly, gently goes down, meanders a little bit. Then there's a constriction at about 30 meters uh, below the surface. And then it opens up into this vast rift. And this rift is 100 or so meters deep. No one's ever seen the bottom. It's been dived to a depth of 96 meters. Um, and above that, there is dry passage and it's large passage and it goes. Um, what we basically need are more cave divers to go and push, push that lead. Um, and, and I hope some people will, will take that up. Uh, it also needs people who can both dive and climb so that when they get to the dry cave on the other side, they're happy to go and, and push the, the scary climbs without fear of the water behind them. Okay, so recap, where are we at? We've crossed off Lower River and Slug Lake, but there's still a lot to go. So uh, while we're in Southern Mammoth, let's rattle off another one quickly. Uh, Grinning Monster Lake. Uh, this is an interesting one. It's not a big lake. Um, it's 
only accessible down a six metre hole, basically. It's drawn as a six metre climb, but um, I think it's basically you just put yourself on a rope and lower yourself into the water. Um, it has been dived. Uh, both of the passages that lead off to the north don't really seem to go. They choke out pretty quickly. Um, it's possible that there's an extension to the dive um, in the southeastern direction, um, but uh, it's a pretty uninviting place to go. Um, what happens when Southern Mammoth floods is that water actually wells up out of this hole from Grinning Monster Lake and then flows down into the rest of Southern section proper. And the last time, in fact, the only time I went to Grinning Monster Lake was shortly after but that had happened and this was just a really sloppy muddy crawl and um you know i don't blame anyone for not wanting to go and dive that because it's mm. pretty gross okay uh so now let's go north um and talk about central river central river is the backbone of mammoth cave it flows pretty much all the way from the northern extent to the southern extent of the cave um these are two parts of the same map i just had to chop it up to fit it on the page a little bit uh, the challenge with Central River is actually fitting it all on the slides because um, it's long. Uh, so water flows in here at the northern end of Great North Cavern and uh, a larger volume flows in at this eastern stream inlet in Twiddly Ompom. And then the water, uh, Central River, flows down Twiddly Ompom. When Central River is flowing, this um, is basically inaccessible. The, there's a squeeze here that will be full of water and the whole of Twiddly Ompom will be inaccessible. Um, there's also an extra inlet at Streamway to Heaven, and most of the water continues to flow down Twiddly on Palm. So I'll come back <laughs> here. Uh, flows down Twiddly on Palm, and the end of Twiddly on Palm is about there, and it's about 20 meters away from Damocles Lake. Uh, but the passage between them does not appear to be passable. Um, it's it's very tight. It's bedrock rift. Uh, it's so close that you have to think the hydro hydrological connection is, is genuine, um, but there's no chance of getting through that passage, I believe. Um, uh, after that, uh, we see Central River flowing at first crossing. It flows into Central Lake, and then it flows underneath Naked Lady Chamber. I'll go back over to the right-hand side. It flows underneath Naked Lady Chamber and into Ice Pick Lake. Um, but the exact course, again, is uncertain because it's tight and it is sunk. I think this is all a lot easier to, to see on a profile view. So um, here we are in Twiddly on Palm on the left hand side. We're looking, uh, looking east here with north to the left. Um, so it flows in Twiddly on Palm. Uh, sorry. Yes, it does. Yeah, it flows in Twiddly on Palm. Um, here's where the passage would be sumped uh, if the river were flowing. And it continues to flow into Sump Too Far, which is the southern, southern end of Twilly on Palm. Then there's this tiny bit where we don't know that the river definitely flows there, but it just seems so probable that we accept that it does. And then we have Damocles Lake, risky business, and the river continues to flow. It loses a lot of flow down to the liquidator, and then we lose track of where it goes. But the river continues to flow, and then uh, here's the overflow sump that I showed a photo of earlier. It's normally several meters deep, and uh, it takes a lot to dry that out. Okay, so um, Damocles Lake, here's that too tight connection that I mentioned, uh, the southern end of Twiddly on Palm and Damocles Lake. It's no more than 20 meters and they're almost at vertically the same level. They might be separated by a meter or two, which is about the right gradient for Central River. So that seems to be uh, a pretty solid inference that, that those two connect, but um, at both ends, it's very tight in bedrock. You're not gonna get through there. Uh, and that of course had to be surveyed in drought. Um, there is a prospect of connecting the two over the top. Uh, if you go into this room, um, there is a, a hole visible through the roof. Uh, the climb there is very overhung um, and it's basically on a muddy wall. Um, so you have to be stupid to try it. So we tried it and um, we, we got someone on my shoulders and I was stood on a ledge and they were stood on my shoulders and we tried to get them up there, but it wasn't quite enough. Um, so you could probably try and build a human scaffold of about four people to get someone up there, or you could just write it off as being ridiculously dangerous and, and not do that. Uh, you'd never get a scaling pole to that part of the cave, and I'm not sure you'd ever get a rescue to that part of the cave either. Um, this rock pile, as you can tell by the name, is um, pretty dodgy. 
Okay, so where does Central River go from there? Um, it flows through the first crossing, um, which as the name suggests, is the first time you cross Central River on your way to the northern part of Mammoth Cave. And then it flows into Central Lake. Um, Central Lake's volume rises and falls quite a lot. Um, I guess in that sense, you could call it quite volatile um, compared to say Ice Pick Lake, which never seems to go below the drought level, uh, no matter what happens for some reason. Um, Central Lake has a, a sump at the, at the southern end, even in drought, um, it, it sumps down here. You can go and visit it, it's, it's fairly pretty. Um, and then the next time we see Central River is through a hole to water in Snake's Gut, and then it eventually meets up with Ice Pick Lake. Um, so here's a couple more photos. There's Josh in the overflow sump again. Um, there's me in the overflow proper, which is um, clearly sort of phreatic passage that's got some bellows modification there. It's quite jagged, it's rough. It's got lots of sculpting on the walls. Um, it's a fun bit of cave. It's also a pretty rough bit of cave, um, but in a drought, it's definitely worth the through trip. It's quite fun. Um, and then above Central River, um, there is an area called Central River Rock Pile. Um, you can do a bit of a through trip through here. Um, it's a new discovery. Uh, when overflow sump is dry and when the downstream sump in lower in Central River, which is down here somewhere, is dry, then you can access this part of the cave. Um, so in 2018 and 2019, this was possible and we, we went here fairly regularly for a while. Um, Phil and I decided to survey it one weekend in May of 2019. And when we drew the map up the same night, we realized, um, so we added all of this area here and we realized how close it got to railway tunnel extension and how close it got to the rock pile and can't get lost. And we figured there had to be a connection at one end or the other. Uh, on the Saturday, we already pushed this end really hard and we just couldn't find a way through to railway tunnel extension. Um, but when we put the, the data into Cervex, we realized how close it was to the can't get lost rock pile. And we thought we'd give that a shot. So we took one team in uh, to the Central River rock pile and we took another team to can't get lost. And sooner or later, we established a voice connection, um, which eventually uh, translated into getting a small person through the connection in the rock pile. Now we had to remove a couple of boulders. Um, it's, it is a through trip if you're a very, very small person. Um, I wouldn't give it a go otherwise. I certainly wouldn't fit. Uh, and you can read all about that in Susball 58-2. All righty, onto Central Lake. Um, as I said, Central Lake's a, a bit of a volatile uh, feature. Um, there is a shoreline drawn here, which is on a little bit of an escarpment. So it's usually fairly well contained but it does rise and fall uh, fairly readily um, and it rises pretty quickly in, in flood. Um, so this photo on the left is from February of this year. I'm stood at the southernmost three meter climb. So I'm stood here over this three meter climb and the water's at my feet. So you can see the water levels substantially risen there. Um, so we could sort of indicate a flood level like that if we wanted to. Um, the water is beautifully clear. I mean, even though this is three meters deep, you can see to the bottom quite easily if you, um, with the correct application of light. Uh, and then in March, the uh, lake level was even higher. Um, so, uh, well, whereas in February, the, the lake was up to this three meter climb, in March, it was way higher up the slope. Um, and uh, it first crossing was flooded to a depth of, of some meters, probably three or four meters. In fact, it was flooded all the way up to the top of the passage there. Um, this photo that's on the left-hand side was taken at this particular location, looking down this eight meter pitch across. And uh, I apologize again, you can't see it particularly well at the contrast of this um, screen, but that's just like, um, you can't see any ground down there at all, whereas normally you can. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty wet right now. Um, and there's the, the, the February level, just to show you how much this lake can rise and fall in, in a short period of time. Uh, at the southern end of Central Lake in drought, you can, you can press along this sumped passage down the bottom here, um, and it's dry uh, up until this, the end, this photo location here. Um, we stuck a camera underneath the water and, and stuck a, um, a headlamp underneath the water as well. And it just, it just continues as the same sort of dimensions, this uh, sort of crawlable passage. Um, so you could dive it if you were so inclined. It probably wouldn't be a very fun dive. I think it would be like this the entire way. You wouldn't have much opportunity to turn around, but it's not too muddy. It's just gravel in the bottom. Um, but, you know, 
once you get in the water, that probably all will change and then visibility will go to zero pretty quickly because the volume is pretty small. Uh, the next time we see Central River after this sump, it's flown underneath abusive intrusive and it's seen down this hole to water in snake's gut. Now this is a photo of that hole to water in drought. Um, I think the thing on the left there might be a snapped bit of dive line or, or wire from, from somewhere. Um, but, but again, uh, you can see the dimensions are pretty small. Actually, you probably can't because there's not anything good for scale there, but the dimensions are pretty small. You wouldn't really want to be uh, messing around diving in there. And then after that hole to water, uh, the river flows somewhere underneath these passages and ends up entering Ice Pick Lake from the western side. Um, that passage is completely unknown. Uh, it does not correspond to this uh, particular uh, passage here, although that does flow in flood, it does not flow in drought. Um, and so even when there's clearly water here, there's not always water here. Um, yeah, so what happens in a strong flood pulse to this particular part of the cave? Um, well, a waterfall is known to flow between central and ice pick lakes. Very few people have seen this waterfall. Um, it was described in an article Mark Starray wrote in the late 1980s. Um, very few people have seen it. I've not seen it. It wasn't there in February um, when Snake's Gut was sort of flooded to this level here. And then we also went to uh, Ice Pick Lake and Naked Lady Chamber in March, and um, Ice Pick Lake was way up. It was at the, um, the top of this two meter climb, basically. Um, Snake's Gut was flooded all the way up to here. So all this passage was all flooded. Um, so you couldn't get in there to have a look. Um, this was a mini lake that had just formed that I didn't even know ever took any water at all. So that was quite interesting. Uh, I really regret not going and seeing if the waterfall was flowing. That would have been good. So uh, maybe I'll go back next month and, and take a look at that. All right, so where are we at in our recap of Mammoth Cave? Um, we've done both of the main rivers. We've got through all of the lakes and that basically leaves Waterfall Passage. So let's just have a quick look at Waterfall Passage. Um, Waterfall Passage is a bit of a rite of passage, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, it's accessed via a low tight squeeze on a corner and the stream flows through that squeeze. Um, so to get it, and the, and the stream flows all year round, uh, even in drought. Um, so to get into it, you basically just have to crawl chest to the ground through this uh, little stream. Um, the water builds up around you and it's quite fun actually, but not for the faint heart, I suppose. Um, but yeah, the stream does flow all year round. Um, if you're in Waterfall Passage, you get dripped on constantly, no matter how dry it is outside, this place is always wet. And all that water is originating from this uh, boundary between the Silurian Shale and the Genoan Caves Limestone. Uh, so the, the stream flows out of the tight squeeze and then it flows into dry siphon. Um, so dry siphon is never dry. Um, it's always got water in it. And then it flows out through this uh, essentially, um, uh, this impenetrable crack in the wall, really. It's, it's very tiny, but it waterfall passage doesn't flow with much water. So most of the water can just drain through it, uh, drain through it freely. Uh, when the water flow is a bit higher, um, this will spill over out on the far side and into one of the passages at the junction. We don't actually know where all of this water from waterfall passage goes. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the cave. Um, so for instance, when waterfall passage flows and water drains out of here, it does not reappear down here, which was the hypothesis for quite some time because we went in drought and all this area was dry and there was no sump here at all. So that one's a bit of a mystery. Okay, um, on to part three. Um, sorry, there were some questions in the chat, but um, they weren't questions, they were comments telling people to mute, that's all good. All right, so on to part three, um, the new flood observations. Um, so this is me, excuse me, um, just stood in the in the gorge in flood. Um, that was on the Saturday of our March. Okay, I'm because I've got to play this. You all right there, Dave? Oh, sorry. Didn't realize yeah. I was on audio. My bad. All right, Matty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was the gorge, <clears throat> excuse me, on the Saturday when it was possible to actually stand in the stream. Uh, I'm stood on a rock, so it doesn't look very deep, but if I were to stand in the middle, it would be above my knees. Um, at that point, you could actually stand in the creek um, and you could get to Mammoth. So there's that photo from the tidal slide of me stood outside Mammoth um, with considerable flow happening outside. Uh, this photo is uh, taken from the climb at the bottom of the jug handle, looking towards Cold Hole. 
um, that is a stream that is flowing. Uh, it's not flowing very quickly. It's, it's almost stationary, but it is flowing a little bit. And there's the same thing from a different angle that's taken from the 40 foot side looking in the opposite direction. Um, <clears throat> we went to Ice Pick Lake on this trip. Um, this is one of the big uh, sort of flowstone slash stall um, formations outside Ice Pick Lake. This is a video and you can get an impression for how much water is flowing. Uh, I've never seen any water on this particular feature, so I was quite surprised to see that volume of water coming down in a place where, yeah, I've never seen it before, wouldn't really expect it. Sorry? Yeah, if it's a formation of the water, that's right. Yeah. Okay, um, this is Ice Pick Lake itself. Um, it's basically flooded um, up to the, the, the lip of that first climb down that you do to go into, uh, into the lake. Uh, so that's probably a good five meters above the level that it was during the drought. Uh, this photo here is looking into Sand Passage. So Sand Passage is completely sumped. And this is uh, stood at the, um, the end of the southern section rock pile. So uh, I'm on a cave ladder at the bottom of the 40 foot, and this is the southern rock pile stream that flows out of the southern rock pile. It actually flows in two different volumes. Um, so there's sort of a major component that comes out of the rock pile proper that you sort of have to sit down into in order to get out of a rock pile. And then there's this extra bit that comes from the side, which doesn't appear to be physically connected to the larger volume. Like they're not coming from the same passage. Um, this is the same thing, but taking from the bottom. So um, this rope is coming down the 40 footer. The ladder probably ends about here. And then stuff's taken this photo basically on rope standing at the, the far end of that passage where it sort of yeah, shrinks down into a, a bit of a rift, tighter rift. So to give you an impression of where these photo locations are on a map, um, here's the one taken of Sand Passage or thereabouts. I think I might've misplaced that by what, uh, somewhere around there. I think I misplaced it by one. I think that was actually taken up there. Um, this is where the two photos of Cold Hole were taken. That was the first photo from the rock pile. And then that was the second photo from the rock pile. And now I've got two videos coming up that were taken from the uh, end of the rock pile and the, bottom, and the start of the rift respectively. Uh, so this is the video from the top of the rock pile. Sorry, from the top of the chamber, you know what I mean, at the end of the rock pile. That's quite a volume of water there. I'll just play that one again. Uh, so that, that was from the end of the rock pile. Oh yeah, I was, I was terrified to, to climb down that cave ladder because normally you climb down that ladder and if you slip, you're like, oh, all right. But if you slip there, you're just gonna get swept away and it's not gonna end well. Um, oops, sorry, it's the same video again. And then here's the second video, this time taken from the bottom. Um, you can see the, the rope, this is the, the rope that had come down the 40 footer. Um, and this is taken from that, that rift just um, before home sweet home. So it's really quite a large volume of water that's coming down. That's looking into the rift there. It was not raining on the surface, no. Um, this was 5 p.m. on the Saturday. It didn't rain at all on the Saturday that I remember, um, at least not to that time of day. Um, yeah, like I say, not to about 5 p.m. things are. Um, the surface creek had been flowing for about three days by that point, um, which is quite unusual. Normally, if the surface creek flows, um, well, it doesn't always get to the Devil's Coach House for a start. Most of it tends to sink around sort of spider if it hasn't sunk before then already. Um, but for it to flow for three days, and it was quite clear water as well. You could drink it if you wanted. I mean, I did drink it actually. <laughs> I'm still here. Uh, I, yeah, it's definitely from the river. It's just a question of how it gets into Mammoth, um, which I'll come back to in a bit. <clears throat> okay, and then I've got one more video for you. Um, this is taken outside of Bow Cave. So 
done the bow in the down. We don't need that much volume on that. Let's take an outside of Bow Cave. Um, Bow Cave is swallowing about one quarter of the flow of the river at this time. And that's largely because there's so much debris piled up outside, which the river itself has deposited there. Uh, so if it weren't for all the debris there, then more of the river would flow in. And I reckon that at higher flow rates, Bow Cave would probably take half of the volume of the flow of that river. Uh, I'll just play that one again. Um, so this, this video was taken at 5.30 p.m. on the Saturday, and then starting at 6 p.m., so just half an hour later, a uh, wide storm front rolled in through Janola and, and dumped 70 mil of rain in the space of a few hours. And uh, the next day was, was really something else. Um, so on the Sunday, the surface creek was flowing so strongly that you couldn't stand in it. Um, we couldn't get across the creek at Playing Fields in order to get to Mammoth. Um, we couldn't get across the creek at Devil's Coach House to look at the caves on the other side either. And what we ended up having to do was climb down Playing Fields Bluff and taking the high bridge that exists near Spider Cave in order to get to the western slopes, uh, sorry, to the eastern slopes of the valley. Uh, so you can, in conditions like that, you can only really cave on the western slopes. So things like Aladdin Bluff, the Gorge and uh, the Dreamtime area. Um, on that Sunday, we, I don't have any photos of this, but we did manage to do two creek crossings uh, using a five meter cave ladder and a five meter tape. And so the, you, know, you tie one end to a tree and then the first person goes out holding onto the cave ladder and then goes and ties that to a tree or something halfway across and so on. Um, it's the sort of foolish endeavor that gets you on the news. Um, it was really good fun, but it was uh, scary as hell and it was rightly considered to be stupid. Um, so I expect that that evening and the following day that Mammoth probably flooded uh, more extensively than it's ever flooded in, in uh, the history of visitation to the cave, basically. Um, because the ground is so saturated right now, all the gravel aquifers are full. The surface creek had already been flowing all the way through the Devil's Coach House for at least three to four days by that point. And then they got 70 mils spread across um, you know, 25 square kilometers of the, the northern limestone. So um, that's a lot of water. Uh, it's actually worth noting that even in the wettest event known prior to this one, which was in, I think it was 1956, um, plus or minus a year, but I think it was 1956, um, even that wet period was not so bad that cavers couldn't get to the cave. And I'm not just saying don't want to get to the cave. I mean, like you step one foot in there and you're swept away and you end up, you know, 20 meters downstream. It was, it was really something else. Okay, so um, this is the final part of the talk. Um, uh, I've got a few points here about uh, water inflows and then I'll talk a bit more about sand passage, bow cave and lower river. Uh, so with great floods come great opportunities. Uh, so what can we learn about that? Um, for Southern, for Southern Mammoth, there are two inflows that are important. You've got Bow Cave uh, and you've got Sand Passage. Uh, so Bow Cave, as we just saw, swallows some of the flow from the river directly. And there's a small conduit that is unfortunately concealed by this arrow, but we'll see it later, um, that takes the water beyond there. And then there's Sand Passage, which has a major water inlet directly below the surface river. Um, we know this because we've got very accurate survey of, of both overground and underground in this area um, due to the efforts of many people, as I mentioned before. But what isn't very clear is what is the relative importance of these two passages in supplying water into Southern Mammoth. So I'll try and uh, articulate what I've learned uh, over the past month or so of, of, um, of investigations and observations. So here's a zoom in on Bow Cave and uh, the northern end of Sand Passage. Um, so as I said, Sand Passage has this major water inlet directly beneath the surface river. Uh, there are also two tight passages that branch off further north and they haven't um, really been fully explored as far as I'm aware. The thing with Sand Passage is that there are microfauna in the soil and so you need special permission to go into Sand Passage otherwise you're just gonna tread on all of the, the worms that live there. Um, so that's not fully explored. Uh, I also mentioned that about a quarter of the surface flow at the moment, uh, maybe other times about half of the surface flow comes in by a bow cave and it disappears down this um, little hole at the back. Um, the last three times we've tried to investigate this hole and um, the first time uh, Rafid got chased out by a wombat. Uh, the second time there was so much flood debris in the cave that you just couldn't get into it. You probably needed a chainsaw. And the third time was um, 
that video I just showed you a couple of slides ago of bouquet flooding, and you definitely don't want to be in there then. Um, so this plan view actually gives the impression that Bow Cave and Sand Passage are really close to each other. Um, and horizontally speaking, they are. Um, but Bow Cave is actually about 30 meters higher than Sand Passage, and there's no obvious passage connecting them either. But that's a little bit clearer in this um, sort of elevation profile here. So you've got Bow Cave at the top there, and that's 30 meters above Sand Passage. Um, it's also worth paying attention to the overall uh, elevation of Sand Passage. So here's that major water inlet high up, as you would tend to expect. Um, and then it's very undulating, right? So you've got a big drop and then water would flow down to this low point um, where it would pull for a while until there's sufficient pressure built up that it would be able to force its way over this um, incline. And then you have the same thing happening a few times down the length of Sand Passage excuse me, before it joins Cold Hole and the rest of Mammoth Cave proper. And I think um, that this should lead to several perched sumps in Sand Passage, which will be important for some conclusions that I've drawn a little while. Um, but first some observations. Um, so Sand Passage can be sumped without flow in the Southern Rock Pile. Um, so that Southern Rock Pile stream that I showed the two videos of um, doesn't necessarily flow even when sand passage is sumped, which to me suggests that some of the sumps must be perched. Um, and it's also um, been observed that sand passage can fill with water without water flowing into Bow Cave, which suggests that um, Bow Cave does not supply sand passage. And as I said, sand passage should contain perched sumps. So, sorry, Simon, that yeah. first proposition yeah. doesn't follow. Okay. It, it may be okay is not the sole source of supply for sand passage because it can fill from somewhere else. Yeah. But that doesn't mean okay does not supply sand passage at all. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. You are correct. Yeah. yeah. But what it should say is that Bocave is not the sole supply of water yeah. to sand passage. And that's also fairly evident from the fact that. Sand Passage is already well developed, sort of 30 meters below, but also to the north of Bow Cave. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I would, oh yeah, modify that to say that Bow Cave does not supply the majority of water that enters Sand Passage, but it might be a contributor, that, that is true. Mm -hmm. um, there's also not any obvious point within Sand Passage where water from Bow Cave would enter. Um, Yes, there's a, a sort of a little bit of sort of broken survey here, which I guess arises from the fact that it's too hard to climb up there. Um, and maybe that could connect to Bow Cave, but really it's just not obvious that that connection is there. Have you thought that the water that goes into Bow Cave goes into the Woolly Rhinoceros Cave rather than to Sand Passage at all? Um, yes, uh, so the water in Bow Cave does have to go somewhere, and the quantity of water that Bow Cave does take does suggest that. Um, there is substantial as yet unexplored passage uh, where this water flows and presumably makes its way into lower river because we don't know where else that water in Bow Cave uh, would go. And so, yeah, the upstream section of lower river somewhere is the sensible place for that water to end up. Uh, no, another thing, uh, the water entering Bow Cave splits. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, near, near the entrance, uh, off to the right, there, there's a shaft going down. Right. And and uh, originally, I used to th th think that Bow Cave was the regu regular source of source of the water in Sand Passage, but of course, there's also the stream sink in the stream bed outside Sand pa Sand Passage, yeah. which um, now ob um, looks screaming obvious that it that it goes to the main water inlet in Sand Passage. But yes. the, the interesting thing to me is, think, is there a connection to the woolly rhinoceros? And is it, and is there poss is it a possible lead to get into the woolly rhinoceros? Um, yeah, so the conduit at the back of Bow Cave, I would suggest, is. Um, the shaft that you mentioned at the entrance of Bow Cave, I, uh, I think that's blocked off at the moment. Uh, either that or it's just, you know, so buried you just wouldn't see it um, on casual inspection. Maybe you could dig it back out, but... Um, yeah, certainly at the moment, the majority of water that flows into Bow Cave is either flowing out of that conduit at the back or um, disappears in the rock pile at the back of the cave. Um, yeah. It didn't look to me like much flow was disappearing at the entrance. Hmm. And another thought, it occurs to me that, that uh, 
some water may go from low points in sand passage directly to the rock pile at the foot of the 40 foot. That, um, that, is, uh, that is there yes. can be more, more water sinking than is coming, coming out at the cold hole. Absolutely, yeah, um, yeah. And, I, and, I agree. And, yeah. And, and and this implies that there is some some leakage from the sand passage conduit that that, can, that connects through to, to the to, to, to the rock pile in particular. Yeah, I fully agree. And that is my next slide. So thank you for facilitating the segue. Um, <laughs> so in sand passage, if we look at the southern end of it, closer to where it joins Cold Hole, um, there are several small outlets. I've circled three of them, the three that are basically large enough that they got included on the survey. Um, but there are many, and they're generally small, which means they're going to be volume constricted. Um, so water must drain from these. And the, uh, the question is, where does it go? Um, it either goes to completely unknown cave or it goes to Southern Mammoth and presumably the Southern Mammoth rock pile. Um, and so a couple more observations are worth adding here. Uh, one is that the Southern rock pile stream can flow without water entering Bow Cave, which is another reason to suspect that Bow Cave does not supply that southern rock pile stream. Um, the second observation is that uh, the stream, the southern rock pile stream, does not always flow when sand passage is sumped. Um, and this is why I suspect that those sumps in sand passage are perched, uh, because the, the small outlets are at very low points in sand passage. Um, like these, these three points are basically the lowest three points, at least to my recollection. And it's what the map suggests. Um, and so if there are sumps elsewhere in, in sand passage, it may well be that they are perched sumps. Mm -hmm. And then the third point here is that those outlets um, are probably volume restricted. Certainly they're too small to get people down. So. Um, they're probably volume restricted and so they don't necessarily imply that there is extensive new passage to be discovered it could just disappear down cracks in the rock and um, emerge through similarly sized cracks in the rock and rock pile which i believe will be too small to be pushed but steph really wants to have a go anyway um all righty um so my conclusion um to all of that is that it's sand passage and not bow cave that's the source of the southern rock pile stream but we do not know where the water that enters Bow Cave ultimately ends up. Some of it may have end up in Sand Passage, but most of it must be going somewhere else. All right, uh, and then this is my last sort of science slide um, on Lower River. Um, I, I showed this slide before, I showed the February 2022 water levels, and I said that I would speculate on this large new debris bank, so here goes. Um, I offer two hypotheses for the origin of this large new debris bank. The first hypothesis is that uh, an extreme flood, like the one that would have swept through Southern Mammoth in March, um, lower river flows out of here at such pressure that this water level basically floods up uh, higher in this passage. And it is similarly met by water flowing out of the gun barrel over the top of this, um, this incline and down the hill, and this is simply the north bank of the river under such flood conditions. And since the flow would necessarily be turbulent here where the two uh, water sources are meeting, it's just where all the debris collects. It collects on the slope um, at the north bank. So that's my first hypothesis. Uh, the second one, which is uh, not mutually exclusive with the first, is that um, there is a sink in Dillon's Creek on the surface that lies very, very close to this particular part of the cave. Um, horizontally, it's probably something like 10 meters and vertically down 50 meters. Um, and uh, that's an obvious place that uh, material could be washed in. And Dillon's Creek has been flowing more than it normally does because the bushfires basically burnt through so much of the, the foliage on that slope that um, all the water's just running off the surface. And on top of the hill, uh, the, the pine forest has also been logged recently. And so you're just getting all of this biological debris um, uh, being carried down. That's my hypothesis. Um, the good thing about hypotheses is it gives people the opportunity to prove you wrong. So uh, have at it. Um, and then uh, this is my final slide. I found this um, uh, amongst my various collections uh, this week. Um, this is my certificate from the Mammoth Cave Adventure Tour. This is the first time I went to Mammoth Cave. 
And uh, Michael Collins was one of the guides that took me on that trip and suggested that I join SUS. Um, I'm very glad that he did, and I hope that SUS is glad that he did. So thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, the word is in the thank chat. Thank you, Simon. That sounded really great. No worries. Um, would you like me to read through the questions that are in the chat? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so Pat Larkin has remarked that there is a well-known major sink near Bokeh, and that's what Henry was talking about as well. And um, that's the one that we believe feeds sand passage. So that's all good. Um, Mike and Jill have commented, uh, I mentioned the jug hole. Um, the highest I have ever seen water, which could be Mike or Jill, is when uh, I could hang onto the jug handle with one hand and lean down far enough to touch the raging water with the other hand. And that was some time in the late 20th century. Yeah, I, I really do think that had we been able to get to Mammoth Cave on that Sunday, that we could, um, we could have observed that too. Um, I really wish we could have got there, but uh, it was just not possible. Alrighty, that's all the questions from the chat. Are there any more from the room or from uh, the just just one thought? Uh, the, the the sound. Oh, sorry, of the... Henry. Sorry, Kier's asking one here, and I'll come back to you afterwards. Okay. Go ahead, Kier. I'm in this slide. I'm interested in the uh, the gravel bed, which is pretty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, the left side. And here, water down there. Yeah. So, how does it change? Um, so, uh, Kia is basically saying this that there has been a gravel bank here in the past. It's not been as big, and there used to be a gap down one side. And how's it changed? Um, Basically, it's much higher now. There is no gap, and most of the debris doesn't seem to be gravels. It's um, it's all sort of bark and soil and you know gross biological stuff. Yeah. Hopefully, we don't end up with we don't end up with foul air down there. That would that would suck. <clears throat> uh, over to uh, Henry. Okay, uh, it, showing up on your thing, a uh, Smirnoff's passage. Yes. There's a thing, an impenetrable rift with the sound of water. I, I've often thought that might actually be be, be Central Central River. Central River. Oh, yeah. um, and I don't I I don't think so because Central River is quite far away from here horizontally. Um, so the, the Central River has to, has to join into the system somewhere. It does, but um, the three-dimensional model that we have of the cave based on the survey doesn't put Central, Niver <coughs> Central River near Smirnoff, unfortunately. Um, I do agree with you that there should be a hydrological link somewhere between Slug Lake and Ice Pick Lake, uh, but it does not appear that Central River could be the water that's heard at the end of Smirnoff. It just doesn't come close enough on the map. Yeah. Like well, 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 what is that water then? What's your alternative hypothesis? Um, I don't really have an alternative hypothesis. Um, I can only rule out the hypothesis that it's Central River based on the three-dimensional map. Um, I, can, I can try and go back to the, um, that three-dimensional model of Mammoth and, and try and show you there, um, which is quite a way back. Okay, so um, where my cursor is here is Smirnoff's yeah. and um, over here is Central River. So Central River flows through, it's seen in Snake's Gut and it's seen in Ice Pick Lake here. And the difference in elevation between those two points is only a couple of meters. So there's just not enough space for it to loop all the way underneath Pisa Chamber to be seen at Smirnoff's and then go all the way back to Ice Pick Lake. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have another um, explanation for, for what that water is that can be heard um, at Smirnoff's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rowena has seen folk seen folk float to mammoth from Wybirds in an inflatable boat um, back in the Pleistocene. Um, <laughs> sorry, Rowena, that was that was a lazy joke. Um, okay, that sounds like a fun trip. Um, cool. Okay. Um, were there any other questions from the room? Rowena yeah. <laughs> <laughs> remarks hump and Kev remarks there are a few Devonian cavers in the club. 
<clears throat> I guess you would prefer similar flood um, signs in the show caves. Uh, so Ma Max is asking if there are similar flood signs in the show caves. Um, it's all the water backing up in the mouth and then slowly being dispersed into the, into the show caves, or is it just flooding right through the whole thing? Um, I'm not exactly sure what's happening in the show caves. I keep asking um, or trying to ask some of the guides, but um, it's difficult for them to make observations as well because various areas are closed, like the Devil's Coach House. And, um, and there's all the work going on with the gravel at, at various times as well. So it's a bit difficult, but um, some of the show caves were closed because they flooded. Um, so I believe like the pool of Cerberus area and stuff, like the water in there was just too high. They couldn't run that. Um, yeah, I, I really don't know, Max. Um, I, I, the average gradient between Mammoth and the show caves is something like 1%, um, so it's not super steep. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to come raging out of the, the sumps in the Imperial Streamway. Um, and it's probably volume constricted at various points as well. Uh, yeah, I just don't know. Um, I'd like to comment that some of the debris in the slope there just below pizza chamber um, is quite substantial, it was several centimetres. Yeah. So it would appear that the flow in from, from above is going through some sizable passage, obviously not, not gravel. Um, well, it's not an area we, we have looked at uh, back in the 80s and seemingly with Bow Cave, we just thought, oh, that's gonna flow into sand passage. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is that it doesn't, maybe that's worth a, a lot more, a better look at. We just assumed it would, so we never really had a good look in there in any of the drought conditions. Yeah. Just too tough to make. The, the whole of southern section between sort of Grinning Monster Lake, or at least the turn off to that lake, and uh, Lower River is now covered with all of this um, relatively fine um, and predominantly biological debris. So all this sort of bark and soil and, and, and sort of brownish silt as opposed to, you know, yellow sand or or you know, gravel. Um, and so it's clearly washing in somewhere. It's not necessarily washing in from that um, inlet at Dillon's Creek that I suggested. And that's just one hypothesis. Um, but um, you know, if you accept that when Southern Mammoth floods, both lower river is very high and the rest of Southern section is, is basically underwater. And so all of that debris can get transported around and I just proposed that it's it's piling up on the northern bank of that river. Um, Rowena's asking, are there any guides on the call who could answer the tourist cave question? Um, let's have a quick look at the participants list. And how is Plainfields Dolling? Obviously full. Oh, yeah, yeah. Plainfields Dolling is full. Um, I can't see any guides on the list. Uh, maybe I missed somebody, but um, I, I saw Anne was on there earlier. She may have gone. Okay. Um, yeah. So Plainfields Dolene um, is full. Um, I know that one of Ian Cooper's um, musings was that there was a connection between the amount of water in in Plainfields uh, Dolene and the capacity of the gravel aquifer to take more water. Um, so basically, when we're seeing water in the Dolan, it just means the aquifer is so full, um, it's basically full to the surface. And that hypothesis seems to be borne out because we couldn't tell that any water was sinking um, from the river at playing fields at all. But then on the other hand, the, the volume of the water flow was so great that you probably wouldn't notice 100 litres per second disappearing from it. Um, it was well and truly an order of magnitude or more um, more flow than that. So you might not notice 100 litres per second disappearing. Um, Mike and Jill, the question was uh, Max's question earlier about how is this uh, flood event manifesting in the show caves? Uh, Dave Appley has also commented that there's a definite small lead just after the 30 metre restriction in Slug Lake that has uh, upstream entering flow. Um, he's asking, you know, could that be Central River? Um, yeah, if there is a hydrological connection directly between um, lower river, sorry, well, yes, lower river, but, but between um, uh, Ice Pick Lake and Slug Lake, 
Um, so on the map, as I'm indicating, that would just be along this line of the cursor. Um, you, you would expect that, yeah, it would flow in via that side, um, but there's just so much unknown passage between the two that um, it would just be speculation uh, at this point, Dave. Um, could be, could be. And are you seeing much water in Horseshoe Cavern? Um, yes, that's a good point. Um, so the last three, I would say, times that I've been through Horseshoe Cavern would be November 2021 and then uh, February and March of 2022. And every, every one of those three times, all the footprints in the mud have been erased. Um, so that has flooded, um, you know, three times in those four or five months. Um, and as I say, the, the, the day after that we were there, uh, I suspect it, it got a right royal flooding. Um, uh, and the water from there has a lot of places it can go. So I don't think that Horseshoe Cavern would get more than sort of waist deep because once it's beyond that point, it can flow through unsurveyed connection, which is its primary draining point, or it could flow um, elsewhere. Um, sort of, you know, down various holes in railway tunnel, yeah. even it could get down to David Jones locker if, if the water level got high enough to push it there. Um, Pat Larkin says, I understand that the sink near Plainfields Dolan is the is in the brackets normally dry riverbed directly, directly south of the Dolan, where the river flows east west, uh, just above end zone and spider. Um, I've certainly seen water sinking uh, just south of the Ford. So if you were to drive down, down Burma Road and try and drive to Mammoth Flat, um, where you sort of ford the river there, um, normally dry, um, just to the east of there, water definitely sinks and you can lose, normally lose all of the flow that's in the river if there is any, but the aquifer is clearly so full that um, it just carries on going. Um, and Simon. Patrick says, if Plainfields Dolan is full, then the aquifer is really full. And I, I certainly agree. That was Coops's hypothesis, and he seems to be correct on that one. Uh, Chris Norton has a question. Yeah, um, just an observation. I was going to talk to you in more detail about this later. But hmm. Ian Cooper, Mark Starray, myself, and Igor Yesbeck were on a trip, which I think was the early 1990s, mm -hmm. uh, when we were at Janola just as a flood was occurring. And the stream was advancing down, filling the sinks, flowing into Bay Cave, uh, and we saw the levels rising and flowing through from the northern to the southern parts of the cave. And yes, probably found I've read the article. The it's report. a fascinating trip report. Yes. yes. Um, what I recall, uh, but you would take the words of the trip report over me, sure. is that at, at, um, when we went into Manor, uh, Central Lake had come up far enough that it was flowing out of the unsurveyed connection area and into Horseshoe Cavern, rather than Horseshoe Cavern draining down into Central Lake. There was water flowing out of there Oh. The, the just beginning to form a lake in the bottom of Horseshoe Cavern. Interesting. Uh, it was just starting to do that as we came into that section of cave. Hmm. We were gone about 30 minutes looking at things, couldn't get very far because of how high up the water was, the skull and crossbones and all that. Yep. By the time we came back about half an hour later, that lake area in Horseshoe Cavern was full and the water was starting to flow further down wow. and join the water that was flowing out of the sand passage yeah. and down into the southern section. Okay. Nice. And uh, so that was just beginning to occur as we were leaving the cave and we thought it was a very judicious time. Really. Yes, I should think so. Um, um, but but um, I, I, the main point to draw from that is that it depends on the flow conditions, but there are certainly conditions where water welling up from Central Lake can come and flow even over top into Horseshoe Cavern and mm. then down the route and the stake through Coal Hole where it meets the, the sand passage strip. I'll have to have a look at the elevation difference, but I suspect there are at least 10 metres in height difference from the 
sort of the edge of Central Lake as it's mapped to um, the unsurvived connection of at least 10 meters. Mm -hmm. So that would be remarkable, yeah. Um, my, my own belief is that water coming out of sand passage splits at the cold hole and, and um, first goes, goes to the 40 foot, but if yeah. there's enough water, it goes the other way and, yeah. and, and, and goes to horseshoe cavern. Yeah, and eventually correct. fills the lake and and then goes by the by the the the, the um, almost extinct river passage which is the overflow from the lake there's also right. some water goes sinks against the wall in yes the, it does in the, in at the, the actual cover. lake yeah yeah you're absolutely right there um cold hole definitely does split its flow and if if um if the 40 foot and and that sort of passage can't take all that water then certainly it um, it also fills Horseshoe Cavern. Yeah, you're right. Yep. So 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 that's where the water water that fills the lake comes from. That's the point I'm trying to make. Well, well, well oh, Chris, Chris Chris is saying most of the time, but you know, if he's, he's also saying that um, water I, can I come from the north. The way, he's saying yeah. it has happened the other way in the past. So okay. Um, yeah, it, well, yeah. I guess I'll see you, gentlemen, in, uh, in Janolan over the next couple of months, and we can, uh, <laughs> we can have a look. Sorry, uh, it 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 would would be nice, but it's it's an awful awful hassle to get from Tassie Tassie to 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 Genola these days. Well, yeah, I mean, sounds like it's worth it if you ask me. But all right, um. well, I, 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 I I know it's worth it. I'm also slowing down. I'm now eighty one. All uh, right, Henry, will you shoot me an email? Shouldn't we'll be doing that. this at all, really. <laughs> I'll be going to the Nullarbor though this year. Okay, very There's nice. There's a Nullarbor trip coming here. And it, Nonsense, it Henry. It's great to see you and great that you still have an interest in this. And it's been wonderful that you've thrown in these insights to Simon's excellent presentation. It's certainly an excellent presentation. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, there's one more question, which is from uh, Julius. Um, he says, does the amount of water we saw in the March Mammoth trip, combined with the nonetheless navigable passages below, imply a yet greater than previously thought downstream flow capacity, as in out of Mammoth and beyond. And um, we don't know what the downstream flow capacity is, but um, what we certainly see is um, there's some kind of equilibrium reached around Slug Lake, right? So Lower River is flowing into Slug Lake at some point, and the level of that lake is not uh, rising or falling on a daily basis, you know, except in response to flood. So the water that's coming in at Lower River and whatever else is flowing into Lower River is also flowing out at that same summed volume somewhere else um, through Spider Cave, as we know, and then through to the Show Caves. Um, I can't really comment more than that because it would be pure speculation. And okay, Rowena thanks. asked, do I have ideas on how to measure the flow? Uh, apart from chucking a, a leaf in and seeing how fast it disappears. Well, for, um, for, good, you know, for goodness sake, uh, you, you use the velocity head method. Oh yes, okay. There's the velocity head method too. Yes, that's, yeah, that's quite and, nice. and and also when it when, whenever possible, try to observe how the how, how the, the the river is coming down to, to try to to try to spot where um, where water is disappearing because you because you can with velocity head often often um, get to the point point where you, where you can work work out where some water has disappeared. Yeah. But, the, but mostly, mostly watch watch how the water um, the water retreats, because it tends to stop at the put at the at the at the put at the points where, um, where where there is a is a concealed sink in the in the in the bed of the river. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I did did a lot of that in 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 my hydrology article. I was doing that most of the time uh, okay. when, when I was doing doing that. Uh, one other point. The, the sediment train that 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 come, that comes down you, you, the usual access to to um, to Lower River, mm -hmm. it it's it's sand with a lot of organics and bits and pieces in it. So there's a fairly a, a fairly open inlet in it. I mean, I mean it, it's probably going through boulders, but it's but it's capable of putting putting sand and 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 dark chocolatey brownie sort of sort of silt silty stuff. Yeah. 
um, which is different to the kind the kind of um, ready brown clay that clay that 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 you that you get in the northern section. Agreed. Yes. And I, I'm not sure from your thing this this sediment bank which is um, which is built up, if it's if it's that sort of more more organic -y clay material. It could be just cut, just coming in the same route that you that, that we we come in in order to get to that point. Yeah, um, yeah, that that that's possible. Um, the, I mean, there's not much flow that comes in through the entrance chamber and, and down to that part of the cave. But um, uh, it, 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 what, what, um, when the rock pile is, is is spouting is spouting water, there's plenty of water move, moving moving through. No, not in the entrance chamber. I mean, not, uh, it's not in the entrance chamber. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring, referring to the bit below the oolite cavern where, um, where you're talking about this new. Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, true. All righty. Um, I'm going to have to end the meeting here. Um, uh, thanks everyone who who attended online and in person. Um, this meeting uh, is being recorded, has been recorded, and I'll find somewhere to host that. Um, so thank you all again and. Um, I hope to see you on some trips soon. Thanks very much.